good here. All right, are we good on all the yeah, things here? Right. All right, we're back here. All right, I'm here with my boy Ben Pollock, right? I said it right? No. I did it wrong again? <laughs> Pollock. Pollock, dude, that's, I did like five times to you like that. Everyone knows that follows uh, Mind Pup knows that I have uh, issues with uh, spelling and with grammar, so of course I've messed that up uh, multiple times. But we're excited to have him down in the studio right now. We did a whole YouTube series, a bunch of cool videos coming your way. But I wanted to pull him aside. I want to talk to you a little bit about what actually uh, I found you first through Jordan Shallow, a good buddy of ours. And one of the things that I was really impressed, aside from your ridiculous lifts uh, that you've done, is also that you keep a very aesthetic physique. And I wanted to ask you, and I wanted your take on, uh, one, how you train. Uh, do you think that you have to train like a bodybuilder to have an aesthetic physique like you do? And how do you currently train right now? So... First of all, thank you. Second of all, to answer your question, I don't think you have to train like a bodybuilder to have a good physique. I think if you want to be a competitive bodybuilder, obviously, then yeah, you do need to have kind of that super high volume routine where you're doing tons of isolation exercises. It's just necessary. But most people don't want to get up on stage in a thong and you know start posing and stuff. Most people just want to look pretty good. And for that, I actually think that you're much better off following kind of a powerlifting type program where your emphasis is really on those heavy compound lifts. It's just going to be a faster way to get to the same place. Now, did you, I mean, when you first started lifting as a young man, were you driven by aesthetics or were you right away driven to strongman competitions and powerlifting? Like what drew you to lifting to start with? When I started lifting, I really had no idea what I was doing. I started lifting for wrestling in college and so, in, or I'm sorry, in high school. And so, you know, I did what my coach told me and I was actually a lot better at lifting than I was at wrestling. And so afterwards, when I graduated, I went to college and one of the guys in my dorm, he was a champion powerlifter in the APF junior or something, I can't even remember, but he started to get a little powerlifting club together. And again, I had no interest in competing. I wasn't really into either bodybuilding or powerlifting at the time. I just really liked training. I liked pushing myself, right? And I wasn't good enough to be a varsity athlete in college. And so, you know, I was trying to find other ways to push myself. And so I really didn't have a good training routine. I didn't have good technique at anything. I was just kind of training for fun, more or less. And so, so are you training like mainly just the core lifts right now that you would do in a competition? Or are you doing any isolation? What does your auxiliary work look like? What are you doing? Yeah, so after I started actually competing, I started doing less and less and less of all the other type fluff stuff is what I call it. And, you know, the less I did, the bigger and stronger I got. Uh, and I was really pouring that energy into the compound lifts, into the bench press, squat, and deadlift, which are, you know, for me, the, the only ones that count. And at this point, it's almost all I do. It's probably 80, 85, 90% of my well, program. Well, let's, let's talk about what you just said. You called it fluff stuff, which I think is great because one of the things when we first created the very first MAPS program, uh, the Everybody, when it first came out, was like, this just seems so basic because we have all the basic lifts in there. And that's what we encourage people to do because, in our opinion, all the years that we've been training, most people neglect those lifts. Most yes. people are scared to deadlift or scared to squat because they're afraid that they can't do it properly. So they avoid it and they find themselves on machines and isolation exercises for years seeing minimal to no results. Absolutely. So what do you what do you, when you say fluff like that? What do you mean by that when you say that? So when I say it, I'm really for, referring to isolation exercises, but that's too broad of a generalization. I think it's it's stuff that's not going to contribute to your overall strength all that much. So things like bicep curls, things like calf raises, things like even you know. And lateral you have huge biceps, dude. So where are they coming from? What are you doing? So now, to be fair, I did do a long for a long time. I just did a lot of fluff stuff when I was training, but I think most of the size is actually coming from. Just the the regular training that I do, your whole body is going to get bigger, right? Like it's not really possible to get big without getting some type of arm development. You said my biceps are big. Honestly, my, my biceps aren't that big, right? <laughs> like relative to a lot of guys, my my height and weight, they're pretty small. But again, I have pretty over good overall development. I'm pretty lean, and so that you know, I look pretty decent. Which I think is unique because of that, because you don't do a bunch of isolation, but yet you still have a very symmetrical looking physique. So even though you're cracking on yourself, you don't think your biceps are very big, they're very proportionate to the rest of your body. Yes, absolutely. And that's, you don't need a whole lot of isolation exercises in order to build a proportion physique. Now, obviously everybody's gonna have different individual strengths and weaknesses that come from their genetics, their leverages, whatever the case may be, just the muscles they like to train more. And so for those people that, you know, you might need to add in a little bit of fluff in order to bring up weak points. But for the most part, you do the bench press, the squat, the deadlift. Maybe you throw in like chin-ups or rows or some type of upper back movement. And that's going to give you a really big and strong physique just if you get really big and strong with those movements. 
things. So what does a typical routine look for you look like for you on a typical or a typical week? Walk me through what a week looks like and what lifts are you doing? And are you doing variations of those lifts or are they are you straight just doing conventional dead, squat, and bench? What does it look like? Yeah. So my training routine comes down to Frequency, intensity, and volume are the three variables that I pay a lot of attention to. And so, you know, volume, we're talking about total number of reps in a week. Intensity, you're talking about, okay, how heavy am I training? What percentage am I one rep max? And then frequency, for me, is really the kicker. And I prefer kind of a higher frequency where I'm training, not muscle groups. I don't think about training muscle groups. I think about training movements. So squat, bench press, deadlift, whatever. How many times a week am I doing that? And for me, I find, you know, often to a point, more is better. And so I like to squat three times a week. I like to bench four times a week, deadlift twice a week. And I'll try and arrange that in a way where I, I typically train four days a week and I'm trying to arrange it in a way where, hey, I'm able to put in the right amount of effort into each one of these training days. Now, you just stressed something that we've been talking to, and we typically have a lot of you know, average people that just want to build some muscle, lose some body fat, but yet we stress these big core lifts. And we also stress something else that you just said, which was frequency. Tell me a little bit about like where you were in your life when you put that together, because we talk on the show a lot that you know, power lifters tend to have this down and they've had it down for years and they really understand volume, really understand frequency, progressive overload. What is that like for you? And where did you put that together? Like how important frequency was for your body to change? Yeah, so really I wasn't able to kind of take advantage of all those things you just talked about until I had refined my technique. So this is probably two or three years after I start competing, right? So I start competing, then I'm like, okay, I can't just like, muscle these lifts up. I actually have to have some type of technique. And so it probably takes me two or three years to really get to the point where my technique was pretty solid, pretty consistent. And at that point, that's when I started to play around with some of these programming variables and say, hey, this actually makes a huge, huge difference. What were the, what were the biggest ones for you? What was the biggest game? We always talk about the paradigm shattering moments. Like, yes. oh my God, light bulb went up. Why wasn't I doing this before? What were the ones for you? Are we talking about technique? Or are we talking about- Well, either one. I mean, for, so, so I think for me, like one, two big things right away, frequency and then not going to failure all the time were like game changers for me what were they for you so for me the number one biggest thing was learning to brace properly and i can still remember the workout where i walk in the gym and i'm squatting you know mid fours and i've done 500 like once in my life and i walk in all of a sudden this bracing thing just kind of clicks and i get under there and i just smash 500 on the squat and it's like nothing and i'm like i'm doing a little dance over in the corner because i'm like shit i just figured this out <laughs> and you know from there going from there from 500 to 650 it's maybe six months where I've just spent two or three years struggling in this 400 pound range trying to figure out how to do this. And so that was definitely my big paradigm shattering thing. But then in terms of um, training, it was really, hey, I got to stop training all the time. I was doing six days a week, twice a day, you know, maybe one day off, but even struggling. What to do is that? that? Why were we all like that? I feel like everybody would, I feel, and it's still bad. I feel like, don't you think oh, it's really yeah. bad? I feel the beast mode, the no days off. I still feel like that's the message that people are giving giving everyone. But when you talk to guys like you that are breaking records, I mean, you rest is probably just as important as the training piece. Well, it's two different types of people you're talking to. A lot of these things that are talking about beast mode, going super intense, whatever, they're talking about people who don't have a lot of motivation to train in the first place. And so you got to get them excited about training somehow and pushing yourself is fun. And so teaching them that, hey, pushing yourself really hard can be really fun. That's huge. That's really important. But then you've got this other group of people who just love to train normally, right? They love to push themselves. They already know this. Right. And they're the type of people who tend to overdo it. And they just want to go on and on and on. And trust me, that's me. But your body can only handle so much. And finding that sweet spot is its crucial. It's the probably the number one most important thing about programming. And so for a lot of people who have that drive to train already, you got to pull them back. Right. What are the signs that you start to notice with your body? Like when you, cause I'm sure you're just like us too. When you love to train already, we're always flirting with those boundaries, yep. right? Just like we talked about, you just got done with a meet this weekend. Part of you wants to train today, but part of you knows that you shouldn't. What are your signs? What are the things you look for? How do you know, like I'm overdoing, I'm not overdoing it. What are you looking at? So short term, most obvious one for me is how hungry I am. So if I've trained like kind of the right amount, I'm basically starving after I train and like the whole day, maybe even the next day. And so that's a good sign to me is like, hey, I trained enough, but I didn't do too much. If that appetite's in the right place. Over kind of more the medium term, it's sleep. Once I'm kind of overreaching on a regular basis, especially when I'm getting ready for meat, my sleep goes to shit. I just, oh, wow. I can't sleep for, to save my when life. When you're overreaching, when you- Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that's more of the medium. So one heavy workout, I'm not gonna do anything. But once you get, you know, two or three or four weeks where you've been pushing just a little bit too hard, it gets really, really difficult. Wow, it's probably frying sleep. your central nervous system. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it sucks because when I'm prepping for a meet, I kind of have to do that. You want to overreach just a little bit so that then when you take your deload, you can super compensate and be a lot stronger. 
for the meet, but you know, I go into it knowing, hey, I'm probably not going to be sleeping that great up a month of, up until the meet. Wow, so that, that's probably the real art of what you do right now is you're trying to overreach just the right amount, yes. but not so much to set you back. It's so difficult. It's so especially because <laughs> you know I love to push and I love to go really hard, and sh- it's really really tough. And I, I think I did a good job of this this past meet, but honestly, that's the, probably the first time that I've, I've really. Made now, it. do you use anything like any or any tools like um like meditation stuff or things to help with the recovery and the central nervous system like is there anything that you utilize right now i'm huge on that type of stuff absolutely huge and i think a lot of a lot of power lifters have no interest in it at all and i just it's mind-blowing to me because it makes such a huge difference so you know when you asked me to go on the show i browsed the website a little bit and saw you guys uh, work with brain.fm yeah um so my girlfriend's actually friends with one of the guys who started it oh, i've no been way. using that for for quite a while as part of my warm-ups really helps me to focus while i'm in the gym but then outside of the gym i think meditation has made a huge difference in the, the sleep stuff that we mentioned in recovery but more than anything else and how i approach my training mentally because finding that sweet spot not only physically but mentally is it's just just as important as being able to do the right amount of work as being able to do the work in the right right way right and so man i was a head case before i started doing that it was just like either before head uh, heavy workout i'd be freaking out because i'd be thinking about it thinking about what it's going to be like how am i going to push myself hard enough how am i going to get through this and then after, or if I had something coming up, I'd just be anxious for days and days. And then sometimes in the gym, I wouldn't be able to focus to save my life. I'd, my head would be all over the place, my form would go to crap, and I'd be feeling tired. And that workout's basically wasted. Yeah. And you know, really practicing outside of the gym, how to kind of have that balanced mindset, um, be more mindful of just how your body is behaving, how you're feeling, it's made a world of difference, especially oh, wow. in my competition performance. Oh, I bet, I bet. Now, also, what about like the way you carry yourself aesthetically? You keep yourself pr- pretty good, sh- good shape aesthetically year around. Do you find that makes a difference? And have you flirted with kind of going out of that range a little bit too? That's a great question. And so there's definitely, definitely trade-offs. And the truth is I'm probably too lean if, if I really wanted to 100% maximize my powerlifting efficiency. Oh, really? Because I think that there are definitely some benefits to carrying just a little bit more body fat percentage, maybe around in the 12 to 14% range. Your joints are probably going to have a little bit easier time. Your leverages are going to probably be a little bit better. Um, you might even have a little bit of recovery because I'm probably in the 8 to 10% range right now. And that's just, it's not too much, but it's just a tad too low. Um, but personally, I cut a fair amount of weight before me. Um, you know, this past meet, I cut about 14 pounds, which honestly is not much for me. I've done as much as 47 pounds in the week before meet. And to do that, you have to be pretty lean or otherwise it's really going to suck. Now, is that because you enjoy being aesthetic and lean and so you tend to lean more that way? Or is it, I mean, what, what makes you do that? Not, what makes you not get yeah. 4% body fat put on? The, the truth is, it's partly habit. It's partly having kind of a fast metabolism. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's partly, you know, the fact that, yeah, I do like being pretty lean. And, yeah. you know, you get more people watching on Instagram. You get compliments on it. And that's nice, right? Like, yeah. it's, it's fun. And so it's all that kind of put together. Does your does your caloric intake fluctuate quite a bit? I mean, are you having to eat a ton when you're getting ready for a show? And then you have the reverse out of that? I yeah, mean, it's ridiculous, actually, um, because the training just gets so long and it's so intense during the meet. Like, some of my last training days, I was in the gym for four hours and I wasn't doing all that much work, but it just takes so long to warm up and you have to rest so long in between sets and you're just moving around for so much of your day that, yeah, you just have to be eating almost nonstop. And at the same time, then sometimes you have to pull back because, hey, I can't let myself get too far out of my weight class. So it's very difficult in terms of uh, making sure that you stay on top of your weight in addition to, hey, the most important thing is how strong am I going to be on the platform? Now, I, we did some videos earlier with you, and uh, I heard you talking about shoulder mobility, things like that. How much time do you spend right now on addressing things like that, or are you heavily focused just on increasing your, your numbers and, and volume right now, or are you mess with mobility work at all? I'm huge on mobility as well. It's just um, when you're doing a lot of pressing movements, it's very hard to then develop that. You'd probably have to take a little bit of break, do more balanced type of shoulder work. And for me, I got to make sure that bench is priority. So the shoulder mobility is very slow to come. But I actually, I work on a weekly basis with physical therapist, chiropractor, massage uh, body therapist, and then do self types of um, types of 
self myofascial release. And that's just to and mitigate all, all this. Yes. Right. So. Yes, absolutely. That's just to stay at that baseline. So then now that I just finished my meet and I'm in my off season, hey, I can actually work on improving those things. But yeah, it takes all that just to make sure that I'm not getting hurt leading up to a meet. And then how long will an off season be for you? Like how long will you be before? When's the, do you have a next meet already in mind? Or? No, for once I don't. Um, <laughs> for the past almost two and a half years, it's just back to back meet prep. And so my off seasons have been maybe a month, maybe six weeks, which is not really an off season, right? That's just a short, a short break in between meat preps, but um, I'm taking I'm taking at least four months before I you know decide on another meat. Um, now, so you've good. got several wins under your belt, and you had some PRs. This was a bit, was this one of the most memorable meets you've had, or what was the most memorable for you? It's up there. Um, so in the past twelve months, uh, fourteen months, I think I've won Boss of Bosses, the U.S. Open, and Reebok Record Breakers, which are the three big raw meets in the United States. So I actually think. Um, Probably the most memorable for me was the U.S. Open. Um, that was just held for the first time this past year, but they had the most prize money ever in powerlifting. Um, so it was like $200,000 total pot. So I got the best lightweight out of that, which was um, a really big deal. And so yeah. it was at the time, but it was memorable to me because, man, leading up to the meet, I just had this vision of how I wanted the day to go. And the day went exactly like that all the way up into the last lift that I just missed by inches. And so it was like almost leaving that little bit for next time. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that was really, really special to me. And then the others have been really special too, but I don't think I'll, I actually don't believe that I'll ever get back to that emotional high that I was at. Them. That one? Yeah. yeah, that's great, man. Well, listen, dude, I'm really, I really appreciate you coming down here, spending some time with Mind Pump. I'm sure this will not be the last time that we have you around. I, I, great time. Yeah, Thank man, you so much for having me. Love, love the work that you're doing. Hey, if you guys like this video, make sure you guys like, subscribe, and share. This won't be the last time you see our boy Ben here.